G'day all, and welcome to the very first shoot of my brand new channel. Uh, so I decided to make a channel based on what is just about my favourite topic in the whole world. Uh, it's music. I absolutely love music. Uh, I listen to it all the time and play it a lot as well. So I wanted to make a channel devoted solely to this brilliant art form and uh, hopefully just share with others a few of the things I've come across and a couple of the you know favourite pieces of music that I've got. Uh, there's going to be three playlists on this channel. I'm thinking that uh, this playlist here will be a music theory playlist. And we'll just go through basically music theory. Uh, hopefully go through just about everything. Uh, in tonal music. And maybe maybe a bit of atonal stuff, but um, mostly tonal music. Uh, it will be western music, I've got to say. I've got kind of, you know, no knowledge at all of eastern music or, or various other ethnic musics. Uh, but my background is really in western music, so we'll be going through... The Theory of Tonal Music, yeah. Uh, the other playlists, we'll have one that's going to be a piano playlist, just learn how to play the piano, so the piano is probably my favourite instrument, or, or it's the instrument that I'm most well versed in anyway. So uh, I hope to share a few of the techniques, uh, I guess, for playing classical music. Um, it's not as hard as people think, and it's a lot more fun than people think. All right, good on you. Uh, and the other playlist, a third playlist, I want to do uh, music appreciation. So I listened to classical music a lot when I was younger, and I still listen to it a bit now, but I think some of the most intelligent and ingenious humans ever to walk the earth <laughs> have been musicians. And just listening to, I don't know, someone like Beethoven in action is, is just unbelievably powerful. Uh, so hopefully we can go through some, um, yeah, some of the best classical music out there and uh, have a bit of a look at how it was written, uh, maybe a bit about why it works or, or why I like particular pieces of music. Anyway, that should be pretty good as well. So that'll be an appreciation playlist. Uh, it's not hard to appreciate classical music, but uh, I just wanted to talk about it really, so <laughs> I'll make a playlist. Good, good. But this particular series will be on music theory, so hopefully we can cover everything from really basic music theory all the way up to tricky stuff like maybe your four-part harmony and, and different chord progressions and things like that. Uh, it will mostly be tonal music, but there's also a lot of really cool things that you can do with atonal music, so if we ever get there, you know, well, good. Yeah, it'll be a long way down the road if we do. But tonal music. Okay, so a lot of music theory comes down to writing out music. You know, a lot of the reason why um, music is written out is based solely in theory. So what basically happened is that people composed music forever. Uh, you know, we had kind of before Beethoven and, and Brahms and all, all of these people, we had musicians composing music for thousands of years. Like, it's, it's quite possible that even cavemen, you know, way before in, in the prehistory uh, were singing different songs and banging rocks together and things like that. But eventually, um, right before the Baroque period, so we're probably talking maybe 1500s, 1400s, um, people started to write down music. So it's really just an aid. It's an aid to the memory. Uh, when we compose a melody, we want to be able to repeat it. We don't want to forget how the melody goes. So writing down music is a really important milestone in music history. And it's really become quite standardised. And what we're going to go through, basically, first of all, is exactly how we write down music. Uh, a few lessons will be devoted to this, uh, just how we write down music. And after that, uh, we have to get into kind of why music works and uh, the various tools that musicians have. And I also want to say that um, a lot of people or a few students in the past that I've spoken to or a few prospective students that I've spoken to uh, have expressed that they feel that getting formalized lessons in theory or, or playing the piano, they feel that it's going to detract from their creativity. Uh, I, think, I think that's not true. Uh, if anything, getting lessons in music theory and seeing the way that music works will only help your creativity. And in the end, whenever you don't feel like using music theory, you can throw it all out the window and do whatever you want. Okay, so music theory is just an additional tool, and it's an excellent tool too. And at the very, very most basic and fundamental level, it doesn't matter how much theory you study and how much you know about music, 
Uh, nobody in the world knows why music does what it does. Nobody. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful, and uh, that's basically all we can go on. But uh, we can have a look at some of the tools that the masters before us have used by studying music theory. Okay, without further ado, let's get stuck into it. Uh, music is written down on uh, a series of five lines. So you'll see just here I've got this. This is a blank page of manuscript. Just a collection of five lines, one after the other. This is what we write music down on. So these five lines are called the staff. I'll just put a bit of an arrow. Staff. Uh, so this is what we write music down on. Let's go backwards. Uh, what you'll see when you see a piece of music, you'll see various clefts over the side, something like this maybe. If it's piano music anyway. You might see something like this. Um, three, four, something like that. Then you'll see a bunch of circles with stems. Yeah, something like that. Good song. Okay, so this is a little bit of uh, what piano music might look like. It's not a very good song in piano. Uh, <laughs> but let's name a few of these things before we uh, have a bit of a practice at drawing them. So first of all, these strange symbols at the sides, uh, this is a clef. This particular one just here is called the treble clef. C-L-E-F, treble clef. Uh, this one down here is called the bass clef. That's a C just there, not a def, bass def. Oh, there's only one F too. Okay, just pretend I drew one F. Uh, the next thing, these, these symbols just here, these cross hatches, that's actually the key signature. It's only got one E. Key signature. You are the key signature. Uh, these numbers just here, the three four, that's called the time signature. Time signature. Uh, these little dots with the stems, those are notes. They're actually crotchets or quarter notes, but we'll go through that all later. Uh, this fellow just here is a rest, and this just here is a bar line. Okay, good stuff. So, if I just rewind, that's what all of those things are called. Let's just have a bit of a go at drawing them. We'll go through exactly what they mean a bit later, I think. But the first thing to do is uh, to sort of practice drawing these things out. So, the first, the first symbol, actually I should say also that this is called the grand staff. Yeah, the piano reads two staff lines together. Uh, so the staff line is just these five lines just here. So the piano reads two of those together, usually, but not always. Usually the uh, top one of the two is for the right hand and the bottom one is for the left hand. Anyway, two of them together is called the grand staff. Um, okay, so we should practice drawing this. So the, the, the funny sort of curly symbol just here is called the treble clef. And to draw a treble clef, uh, I don't know if everybody draws these the same, but what you do is you start on the second line from the bottom, you curl up to the third line from the bottom, back down to the bottom line, all the way up to the top. There we go. You got yourself a treble clef. Uh, so it might have a might might pay to have a bit of a practice at drawing treble clefs. You get used to them after a while, and um, this is called the treble clef or the G clef. So treble or the G clef. Uh, and it's called the G clef because uh, actually the lines on the staff don't have a particular note. They don't mean any particular thing uh, until you put a clef down. As soon as you put a clef down, the lines on the staff mean something. And the G clef actually indicates where middle G is. So I don't know if you're familiar with the piano, but there's a there's a a white key about middle way up the piano, uh, which is called middle G. There's a whole bunch of G's, but there's only one middle G. And middle G is this line just here. Yeah, the second from the bottom line. So the treble clef was originally an elaborate G. It, I don't know, I guess you could imagine something like that, maybe. Yeah, I suppose that's how it came about. 
I don't know, have a look on Wikipedia. Uh, anyway, what the symbol is actually doing is drawing a circle around that line to indicate that that's what G is, just there. Yeah, the second line from the bottom. So if I was to see, it's, it's actually not that important where you draw the treble clef. Like if I'm drawing music for myself that I'm going to read, I'll just kind of scribble something, you know, which vaguely re resembles a treble clef. Uh, and I'm not actually going to read that and say, well, you know, that's circling this space just here, so this space must be middle G. That's not what I'm going to do. I'm just going to say, well, it looks like a treble clef to me, so that's G just there. Yeah, but when you're starting out, I think it's particularly important to draw treble clefs as neatly as possible just for a little while until you get used to it. And after a while, you know, when you're trying to write out music and maybe music for yourself that other people aren't perhaps going to read, uh, it doesn't really matter where you draw the treble clef. Anyway, that's good. Let's have a look at the bass clef. Alright, so the bass clef is the other one. This usually, but not always, means the left hand. Uh, it's really easy to draw. All you do is you just draw a little kind of squiggle thing on the second line from the top. Then you curve up to the top line and back down, and you kind of go down to the bottom space. And then you put two dots either side of the second from top line. So this is the bass clef. Uh, but the other name is uh, the F clef. It's got one F, dude. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so apart from the fact that I keep putting two Fs on the end of clef, uh, the bass clef was actually an elaborate F, so you can kind of imagine an F if you use your imagination a bit. Yeah, it looks a little bit like the F if you um, just connect those two dots with a line. Yeah, that would be an F. Uh, but where the treble clef points out middle G, the bass clef actually points out F. So the line between those two dots is actually F. This right here, this line just here, is F. Uh, it's not middle F, it's the F below middle F, but you know, it's F anyway. So that's what the bass clef does. It points out where uh, F is. Yeah, so you can have a bit of a practice at drawing your bass clef if you like. Uh, just remember to start on that second line from the top and uh yeah it's a lot easier than the treble clef. It's not as it's not as elegant a symbol though, I don't think. Sorry bass players. You can if you want put a bit of a Oh that's pretty good. It's a good looking bass clef. Um alright, oh there there is another clef as well. So we've been through the bass clef and the treble clef, but there's also, particularly if you're um a singer or if you play some woodwind instruments uh, you'll also see the C clef. Now I draw this differently to oops, I draw this differently to how um, you'll see it in printed music, but that's how I draw it. Yeah, uh, I think in printed music it looks something like something like that, maybe. Yeah, yeah. This uh, this this is how I draw it anyway. It's just a nice and simple thing. And this clef here actually points out C. Uh, it's sometimes called the alto clef, I think. So, alto clef, uh, or the C clef. Um, so this line just here, this middle line that the clef is kind of pointing to, uh, is C, middle C. Middle C. Uh, this particular clef you do see moved around, so you might see, I think that's for alto. Uh, but you'll also see on this line just here, yeah, the second from the top. Uh, but the other clefs tend to stay in the same place. Yeah, but I think I think the alto clef will have something like that for tenor. Yeah. Anyway, you tend to use the alto and the tenor clefs mostly if you're writing for particular woodwind instruments or if you're writing for voices. Yeah, sometimes you might write the alto voice with an alto clef and the tenor voice with the uh, the C clef as well, but I've got to say that if I was writing a four-part harmony or something, I would just write the sopranos and altos with uh, a treble clef and the bass and tenor with a bass clef. What are you talking about? Um, alrighty, so the other part is uh, the key signature just here. Now, we're not going to go into this now because it's actually quite a big topic, but we are going to go through the symbol. So that little symbol just there, the crosshatch, is called the sharp symbol. Sharp. It looks like that. It's meant to be on an angle, sort of an italics, an italics crosshatch. So that's just your regular crosshatch there, much like how I drew them above, accidentally. Uh, but the actual sharp symbol, the um, cross, 
hatches bit, the kind of the horizontal lines are on a bit of an angle. So that's the sharp symbol. And what you do is you make the space of the crosshatch fall either on a line or in a space. So say you wanted this bottom space just here to be sharp, maybe you've got a note that looks like that. Uh, if you want to sharpen that note, then you put the crosshatch just there, so that the space of the crosshatch is on the same space as the note. Uh, or if you want to do a, a line, maybe you've got a note up here, like that, minimum on the second from top line. If you want to sharpen that note, you want the space of the crosshatch to go straight on top of the line, just like that. Okay. Also, yeah, if you if you if you're writing music sort of quickly and you write something like, you know, that, uh, people are going to know what you mean anyway. They're going to. But try and be neat. Yeah, try and be neat. Okay, so that's how you draw a sharp symbol. We should go through the opposite of the sharp. So we didn't have it above, but there is another symbol, the opposite to the sharp symbol, which is a flat symbol. F L A T. Flat. Oh, that's a bit of a weird F just there. Let's go again. Flat. Flat. Okay, so flats are pretty easy to draw as well. They resemble a little B a bit, but I would draw a B like this, right, with a nice big kind of body. B for body. Uh, but the flat symbol, I draw a stroke down, then diagonally up, and then kind of connect it up to the line. So the flat symbol is a little bit different to a B. It's not as round. It has a kind of diagonal base. But, uh, yeah. Oh, that's a good looking flat symbol. Look at that. Beautiful. <laughs> Get over yourself. <laughs> Oh gosh. Okay, so with a flat symbol, you want the body of the flat symbol to be on the line or in the space that you're indicating. So say we want this middle line just here to be flat. If we want to flatten this note just here I've drawn, you would draw the flat symbol before it or to the left of it, and you would make the line go through the body of the flat symbol. Uh, if you're in a space, it's pretty easy as well. Just like that. Yeah, you make the body of the flat symbol be in the space. So that's the flat symbol. We'll go through what they mean later, but they, they yeah, they're pretty easy. Uh, it just means raise a note one space or, or lower it one space. That's the sharpened flats. Uh, the time signature we're not going to go through for a little while because it's actually really, really confusing. But it's a good topic. It's a good topic. And it's very closely related to this big line just here. Yeah, I'll draw a big, uh, a big bar line just here. And that bar line and the time signature are very closely related. Um, okay, the notes. Yeah, actually, we don't need to practice drawing a time signature. I mean, it's just three and then four. Like that. You will see, actually, if you um, look at some people's handwritten sheet music, sometimes they do this. They just write a great big three and then a four, like that. I mean, it's cheating, but they do it anyway. Uh, or it might be 4-4, four, four, so you might see like 4 and then 4. Uh, if you're ever reading someone's handwritten sheet music and you see that, then it it means the uh, time signature of 4-4 four, four and 4-4. Four, four. Yeah. Um, okay, so we don't really need to practice drawing numbers, I don't think. But we should practice drawing notes. Um, okay, so before we stop for the day, uh, notes. Um, notes usually are little circles like this, that's a circle. Uh, they can have a stem, like this, so this would be the head. Uh, this just here is the stem. And you'll also see note heads that aren't coloured in, they mean something different. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you'll see notes that have no stem, like that, that means something different again. That actually means uh, a whole note. And that's a minimum, or a half note. But we'll go through the names of them all next tune, I think. Uh, what you'll also see often is uh, notes with tails. So we'll have a note head, then a stem, and the stem will have a tail. Uh, so that's the tail right there. Tail. Or you can see a couple of these joined together. So two notes with tails joined together looks like that. Yeah, you might have seen that before. It's a TT in... Uh, what is his name? Zoltan Kadai. Yeah, the Kadai method calls those TTs. Anyway, that's the tail just there of notes joined together. Yeah, they just join their tails both up. 
Uh, you can actually have more than one tail on a note, so we might have something like that. Uh, which is, it's, it's a different note duration again, that's a really quick note. Uh, or you might see a whole bunch of those joined together. And if they're all joined together, all you do is like that. Yeah. Okay, so that's two tails on those. Those are um, actually semi-quavers, but we'll go through all of that stuff later and what it means exactly. But uh, it's probably a good idea to get used to just drawing out a few notes. And if you feel so inclined, just write a little song down. Let's have a go. Okay, I'll put that there like that. And I might make it 4-4. Four, four, common time, in other words. And how's my song going to go? Ah, oh, I just thought of the best melody. Oh. I just... Ah, oh, this is going to be great. I think... Yeah. Oh, what a good song. What a good song. This is a great melody. Yeah, if you want, just practice drawing out a melody. It doesn't matter how it goes. Just uh, make it up. And then later on, or if you know how to uh, read music, take it over to a piano and see how it sounds. And if you're so inclined, give this a play. See if you can work out what it is. Okay, that's not actually how the song ends, but that's that's a good melody. I just thought of that then. Amazing. That's really going to take off. Anyway, that's just a quick toot on uh, drawing various symbols. Oh, we also had the um, rest symbol here. But uh, you know, we might have a look at rests a bit later. Uh, just a quick toot on drawing symbols and what some of the symbols are called. And next toot, I think we'll get stuck into what they mean. Maybe the um, note durations. Yeah, so it's important to know how long to hold down notes. And uh, I guess we'll have a look at that next toot. Anyway, thanks. Thanks for watching. And have a good one. See ya.